couple of things, and then we'll move into our study. You've already opened your Bible to Revelation 20. We'll be looking at verses 1 through 10 this morning as we continue our series here in the book of Revelation. I would invite you to be part of the, um, of the uh, if you're young, a young adult, you know, we do have a young adult study on Monday nights, on Tuesday. Uh, John uh, does a, a men's study at 6.30 and, and a breakfast. On Wednesday, we're going through the, uh, the book of Job, a very appropriate book for the times that we're living in, right? And uh, so I'd appreciate and love to have you with us if you came on a, on a Wednesday night. And uh, we've been mentioning Israel. We have uh, over 200 with interest to go. If you've never been to Israel, um, I would really encourage you. It, it really does uh, cause your Bible to come to life. And there's quite a number of people who are uh, apparently desiring to go. And I'd love to have you with us. We're going to be with other uh, churches. We're going to bring uh, go along with uh, with Brennan from uh, uh, in some church. I don't even know the name of it. It's out there somewhere in Orange County. It doesn't really count. It's in Orange County. Um, now, Brennan Beeler will be with us, and, uh, and uh, a friend of mine named David Maestas, who's from Los Lunas in, in uh, New Mexico, and um, you know a couple of other uh, uh, dear friends, uh, Holland Davison, and we'll have a, a great time. And so anyway, if, you, if you're wanting to go, we'd love you to go with us. And, and uh, one of the sites that we discovered Actually, John discovered it. I think I shared this the other day. Um, John discovered it. And naturally, it would be John who did. It's a taco shop in, <laughs> in Jerusalem uh, called Tacos Luis. And uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, we, we, uh, we went there while we were in, uh, in Israel last time. And, uh, and I mentioned it to some, some of the people. You should, should have seen the brown cloud that descended on Tacos Luis. It was wonderful. <laughs> we had a good time. And, uh, but, you know, we just love Israel. I'd love to have you guys go with us if you can. And uh, that would be a blessing. Now, we're in Revelation 20, 1 through 10. Let me begin, before I even begin, let me begin by sharing with you that in the last several chapters, because what we're looking at is what is called meat. The Bible speaks concerning milk, which is it's another way of saying it's something that, that new believers uh, partake in because the milk of the Word is what gives you strength. But there's also what is called meat, the meat of the Word. And, and what we're looking at is called the meat of the Word. Now, sometimes people may not um, have had experience in Scripture very long. And, and some of this may seem kind of like over your head. Please, if it does, don't, don't get... Don't get upset about that or anything like that. This is not an easy portion of Scripture for us to read, to study, and to really grasp. So I, I have, with that intent, I have, I have been making my notes more thorough so that I can give to you more things that maybe right now, you, you, it, it may be like, what? I, that, this, I don't, this is kind of boring and this and that. But I'll tell you what, if you get that as your foundation, um, a, a, a lot of your life in terms of just how you see the things of the future is going to help to straighten those things out and give you a clearer view. And so what we're looking at is the coming kingdom. Now, the kingdom we're looking at is called the millennia, millennial kingdom, thousand-year reign of Christ. And uh, again, I'm not going to give you a full teaching. I can only touch on a few of the things that relate to that because, in effect, what we're looking at is actually the, the one of the things that will occur called the incarceration of Satan. And so you will see that. What's going to happen to that, that evil one? You'll see that in this passage. And so kind of laying the foundation. It's going to take a while for me to lay a foundation, and then we'll roll on into some things that are applicable. No. So with that said, let's begin reading together in Revelation chapter 20. And I'll begin reading at verse 1 and read to verse 3. And then we'll move into our study with my introduction, which takes a while, and then we'll look at these verses. Revelation chapter 20, beginning at verse 1, reading to verse 3. John writes, Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. 
And he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. But after these things, he must be released for a little while. We're going to be looking at aspects of what has been called the millennial kingdom, a kingdom where Jesus Christ rules and reigns on earth for a thousand years. And it's going to be a time of peace, love, and joy. And as I was thinking about that, I remembered that when I was in my teens, there was a song that was released. I still enjoy hearing it, even to this day. It was written by someone named Brian Wilson. And uh, he was in a group that some of you might remember called the Beach Boys. And you look at them now, you wonder how could you call those old fossils boys. But they were the Beach Boys. And they had a, uh, a song, many songs, but this one song that stands out in my memory is Wouldn't It Be Nice. And in that song, they say, wouldn't it be nice if we were older? Then we wouldn't have to wait so long. And wouldn't it be nice to live together in the kind of world where we belong? Songs like that became popular because most of us want to have a better world to live in. Most would like to live in a world that's filled with love and joy, a, a world that is filled with peace and, and happiness, a, a world where people enjoy good health, a long life, where they enjoy security, a restored environment. We'd like to live in a world where even the animals get along. And this is the kind of place that is promised in Scripture as God's future earthly kingdom. It's a place where the curse on planet Earth is removed forever. When you read your Bibles and you go into the very first book of the Bible, the book of Genesis in chapter 3, we see that Adam and Eve partook of forbidden fruit. And after they did that, that God had placed a curse on the Earth. In Genesis 3, verses 17 through 19, it reads, Then to Adam, he said, Because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the, the tree of which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth to you, and you shall eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. So notice how he had said that. Notice he said, you have heeded the voice of your wife, and that's why I don't listen to mine. But anyway, <laughs> see, this future earthly kingdom will be a place of peace, even in the, the kingdom, the animal kingdom, if you will. In the book of Isaiah, chapter 11, verse 6, it says, in that day, the wolf and the lamb will live together. The leopard and the goat will be at peace. Calves and yearlings will be safe among lions, and a little child will lead them all. Obviously, such a thought seems to be ridiculous because it sounds to many that this describes an imaginary world. It does seem beyond reason, but this is actually the world that has been promised to us. It describes a future millennial kingdom a kingdom that exists after Jesus Christ returns and begins to rule. It, it culminates what has been called by the, theologians redemptive history. It's the hope of all believers throughout all the ages. In Romans chapter 8, verses 20 through 22, the apostle Paul said it like this. He said, For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. The whole creation groans. You see, the millennial reign of Jesus is something that is found in the Bible, found in the Old as well as the New Testament. It's a promise that is found many times throughout the Bible. Someone said concerning the millennial reign, they said the millennial reign will be a period of time in which Jesus Christ will reign on earth for a thousand years as a sovereign ruler in fulfillment of many Old and New Testament prophecies. During his reign, Satan will be bound and sealed in the bottomless pit 
so that he will have no influence in the earth to deceive mankind. Jesus' rule will span the entire world. He will be king of kings and lord of lords of the whole world. He will also sit on the throne of his father David, ruling over Israel. So when you read your Bible in the book of Isaiah, chapter 2, verses 2 through 4, it says, In the last days the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established, and the highest uh, of the mount, on the highest of the mountains it will be exalted above the hills, and all nations will stream to it. Many peoples will come and say, Come, let us go to the mountain of the Lord, to the temple of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways so that we may walk in his paths. The law will go out of Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He will judge between the nations, will settle disputes for, all, for many peoples. They will beat their swords into plowshares, their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. In Jeremiah 23, 5 and 6, Jeremiah said, The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, a king, who will reign wisely and do what is just and right in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved. Israel will live in safety. This is the name by which he will be called the Lord, our righteous Savior. And then again, another prophet, Zechariah, said in chapter 14, verse 9, the Lord will be king over the whole earth. On that day, there will be one Lord and his name, the only name. So when we think of God's reign today, we need to understand that as he rules today in our day, he uses what are called political and religious means. Political obviously represents his rule through human government. And that's one of the ways, the reasons why we pray for those in government. Like it says in 1 Timothy 2, verse 2, we are to pray for kings and all who are in authority that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. That's why we pray for those in political position. But his rule is also religious. And, and when his rule is, is declared to be religious, that simply means that he ministers through the body of Christ, the church. You see, we have a message, a message of the kingdom, and, and God has entrusted us the message of the kingdom to take to people and to proclaim it. Paul himself spoke of this in Acts 20, verse 25, when he said, uh, indeed, now I know that you all uh, among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God will see my face no more. I have gone amongst you preaching the kingdom of God. You see, as people come to faith in Christ, God's rule is established in their hearts. And as God's kingdom is lived out in his kingdom, the world begins to be transformed. People are saved, they become salt, they become light in a sin-corrupt and dark world. Paul in Philippians 2, 14 and 15 said, do everything without complaining and arguing so that no one can criticize you. Live clean, innocent lives as children of God, shining like bright lights in a world full of crooked and perverse people. So God's kingdom is to be lived out in his children, and we take this message of the kingdom so that the world can be transformed through saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Well, in the millennium, his rule occurs through Christ, and he unites the political with the religious. Now, another bit of information to lay a foundation for you. Some Bible commentators teach that the use of 1,000 is simply uh, symbolic. They're saying it's not a literal thousand years. It's just a symbolic number to let us know that it's going to rule. It's going to be for some time. But one commentator responding to that statement pointed out that that John gave precise numbers and and he has. We've seen this as we've gone throughout the book. Remember, in chapters two and three, he spoke of seven churches. In chapter seven, he spoke of 144,000 Jewish evangelists. He spoke of three angels connected with what is called the three last woes in chapter 8. In chapter 9, he spoke of an army of 200 million. He spoke of three judgments, the seal, trumpet, and bowl judgments, each containing seven judgments. In Revelation 16, he saw three unclean spirits. He spoke of seven angels. So there's no reason to think that Jesus would not literally reign for a thousand years. Remember, Gabriel, the angel, had spoken to Mary concerning the birth of Jesus. It's recorded in Luke chapter 1, verses 31 through 33. He said, you will conceive and give birth to a son, 
You will name him Jesus. He will be very great, will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David, and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. Well, it's been said, if, if Mary conceived a baby by the Holy Spirit, gave birth to a son, named him Jesus, who is the Son of the Most High, why would Jesus not also literally rule over Israel upon his ancestor David's throne? And so this is something that we look at as being a literal thousand-year reign of Jesus Christ. And what we get in the verses before us is a snapshot of the reign of Christ. What we'll see actually pertains to what will happen to Satan. Now, as we're about to enter into our study, we're going to pick up our study after Jesus has returned. He's already wiped out his opposition. We saw that in chapter 19. He returned with his armies, the armies of heaven, and we saw how the armies consist of angels and saints alike. We see that Antichrist, the false prophet, have been captured. They've been cast alive into the lake of fire. And when they are captured and cast into the lake of fire, that leaves the world's armies without leaders. And so the Antichrist and his false prophet are the first to enter into final judgment. And that gives us insight into the permanence of judgment. You see, these two still appear in the lake of fire after the thousand-year reign of Christ. They're not annihilated. There are those who say, oh, they're just going to cease to exist. They're going to be annihilated. No, they're not annihilated. They continue suffering under judgment. There are people who say that, that, that people who are unsaved when they die, they simply cease to exist. It's called annihilationism. They teach that after the final judgment, all unsaved human beings, all fallen angels, and Satan himself will be totally destroyed or their consciousness will be extinguished rather than for them to suffer everlasting torment in hell. So they teach in annihilationism. And that's not what the Scripture teaches. The, the Scripture teaches that people will not cease to exist but continue on in a, a conscious state for eternity. In Matthew 25, Jesus said in verse 41, he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you who are cursed into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. He went on in verse 46 to say, these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. When you look at the words in verse 46 of Matthew 25, the word that is translated everlasting and the word that is translated eternal, everlasting punishment, eternal life, they're the same Greek word. So the length of judgment is forever, and eternal life obviously continues forever. And so this is what is going to take place. As we look at this, Jesus has returned. The battle of Armageddon has ended. The tribulation is complete. Now we're going to see Satan bound. We're going to see Jesus' thousand-year reign. We're going to see the final rebellion. Next week, we'll conclude with the great white throne judgment. There's your introduction. Let's get into our study, beginning at verse 1. I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having a key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. So chapter 20 opens with an, another vision of an angel. This is the 13th time since chapter 7 that angels have been referred to in this manner. The question is, who is this angel? And once again, let me briefly say there are those who believe this could possibly be Michael the archangel because we already saw him revealed as, as Satan's adversary uh, in chapter 12. And we know that Michael has had dealings with Satan in the past because in the book of Jude, verse 9, it reads, even the archangel Michael, when he was disputing with the devil, about the body of Moses, did not himself dare to condemn him for slander, but said, the Lord rebuke you. So Michael is associated in combat with the devil. And so some say this very well, maybe Michael, but we don't know. But this is a key. Notice it says he has a key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. He has a key to the bottomless pit. He has enormous authority is the picture. He's been sent to earth to take Satan, to bind him in this abyss for a thousand years. Now, the word abyss is a Greek word, abuso. And the, the abuso is the abode of demons and all manner of unclean spirits. It's a temporary place of incarceration for the most evil demons. It's not the final place of punishment because the final place 
of punishment is the lake of fire. And we've already seen that some of these demons have been released during the tribulation. Again, in Revelation, in chapter 9, verses 1 and 2, it said, The fifth angel sounded his trumpet. I saw a star that had fallen from the sky to the earth. The star was given the key to the shaft of the abyss. When he opened the abyss, smoke rose from it like the smoke from a gigantic furnace, and the sun and sky were darkened by the smoke from the abyss. So some demons had already been released during the tribulation, but now he's bound, as it says here in verse 1, and he's placed into this bottomless pit. And it says that there was a great chain in his hand. And so this gives us uh, the sense that he is going to be rendered inactive. This angel has the authority to open the abyss, but he also has the authority of, of, of shutting Satan inside. When it speaks of a great chain, that shows us a picture not only of the authority of the angel, but the authority or the, the, the power that Satan wields because he has deceived the world. Now, when you read your Bible, in 1 John 5, verse 19, it says, we know that we are of God and the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. Satan's sway, his influence, is not just in certain regions, but the Bible says that his sway is throughout the world. That Satan's sway, is, is, his influence is, is worldwide. And so it gives to us a picture of, of, of who he is. I want you to notice in verse 2 how it says, he laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan. These are names and images of God's greatest adversary. Jesus, when speaking of him in John 12, verse 31, spoke of him as the prince of the world. Notice how he's spoken, spoken of. He is the dragon, the serpent, the devil, Satan. When it says that he's called the dragon, that describes his ferocity, his cruelty. When it speaks of him being the serpent, it's a reminder of the temptation of Eve in the garden. When he's spoken of as the devil, the word devil in the Greek language is the word diabolos, and diabolos uh, speaks of the one who slanders. He's also called Satan. The name Satan is the word Satanas, and that means the accuser, the adversary, the one who resists. And so this dragon, this ferocious, tempting, slandering accuser is being spoken of. Now, since the middle of the tribulation, Satan has been extremely active. We saw that in, in chapter 12, verses 7 through 9. It says there that there was war in heaven, and Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. In verse 12 of the same chapter, Rejoice, you heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has gone down to you. He is filled with fury because he knows that his time is short. But now he's inoperable. Notice in, it says in verse 3 that he cast him into the bottomless pit, the abuso, and shut him up and set a seal on him so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. After these things, he must be released for a little while. So the angel lays hold of Satan. He casts him into the abyss. He locks him in. He sets the seal on him, renders him inactive, and binds him for a thousand years. But later, he'll be loose. We'll see that in just a moment. But here, Satan is under confinement. He's jailed in the pit. He's inoperative, but that's temporary. He's going to be loosed at the end of the thousand years. Well, what's going to happen when he's freed? Because it makes it very clear that at one time he, he, is, he is going to be freed. After these things, he must be released. He'll be freed for a little while. What is, he, what is he going to be freed to do? Well, while he's in the pit, he no longer has the ability to deceive the nations. This is the one who had deceived the nations. This is the one who has been talking to the nations, whispering in their ear, if you will, forever. And to deceive the nations is what he does. 
That's a tactic of the enemy. I want to talk to you about that for a moment. In John chapter 8, verse 44, Jesus was speaking to his, his adversaries, his opposers. And he said this to them. He said, you are of your father, the devil, and the desire of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he's a liar and the father of it. He is the deceiver. Satan is the one who has been deceiving mankind. And one of his greatest, if not the greatest deception that he has is this, that he has deceived people to believe that they don't need God to be good. He has deceived people to believe they don't need Jesus Christ to be saved. There's a lot of people who say that there are many religions on the face of the earth, and I've said this before, and some of you have heard me say it. There aren't many religions on the face of the earth. You said, no, wait a minute. There are whole books. There are whole studies. Uh, you know, I've taken comparative religion. What are you talking about? There are, there are many, many, many religious beliefs and faiths on the earth. There may be some major faiths, but there's a multitude of faiths. And, and so the argument is, is, no, there are many faiths, and, and Christianity is just one. But you, understand from, you need to understand from a Christian perspective, there's only two. There's God's truth, which is the true faith, and then there's every other thing that's a lie. There's only one truth, and that's Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. He didn't say, I'm one of the ways, or I'm part of the ways, or I'm, a, I'm the way for those in Israel or the Western world. No, he said, I am the way, and nobody comes to the Father but by me. And that's the message that the apostles preached, for there is no other name given under heaven whereby we must be saved. That's what the Scripture teaches. That's called Christianity. And so many people will argue and say, oh, no, there are many faiths. No, there's God's faith, which is truth, and there's a lie. And the enemy has used deception from the beginning. That's why Jesus said, you are of your father, the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there's no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources. What is the greatest deception? That you don't need God to be good, that you don't need Jesus Christ. Remember when the, the serpent, all the way back again in Genesis, was speaking to, to Eve and, and was bringing deception and it said, uh, are you, you, can you eat everything in, in the garden? No, no, God has said there's just one, one, one tree that we're, we're not supposed to even touch. He added to the word of God, lest we, lest we should die. And then Satan responded in Genesis 3, 4, and 5, and he said to her, you will not surely die. God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened. You'll be like God, knowing good and evil. From the beginning... From the beginning, he called God's word into question. He's the deceiver. And as the first liar, it is he who fashions deception to keep humanity spiritually blind. Paul spoke of that in 2 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4, when he said, even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. The spiritual blindness, where he causes people to, to yield to their own nature, which rejects the things of God by nature. And so Paul says he keeps them spiritually in bondage because he keeps them spiritually blind. Obviously, he's still busy now. Look at your world. Look at the world that we live in, and you'll see that he's very busy now. He's not bound yet. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, Be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking for someone to devour. He's busy doing that to this day, seeking someone to devour as a roaring lion does. We've been going through the book of Job on Wednesday nights, and in the book of Job, we see the first two chapters where the angels assemble and Satan is present amongst them. And God speaks to, to Satan, where have you been? What have you been up to? What God does is he's actually calling him to give an account of what he's been doing. And he says, well, I've been going to and fro. And the reading of that in the original language gives us the inference that he's saying, I've been up to no good. I've been going back and forth looking. And that's why God says, have you considered my servant Job? Uh, have you weighed him in your balance? Have you sought a weakness in him? Have you found something about him that you can use against him? Have you? 
Have you considered my servant Job? Have you judged him? Have you looked at him closely? Are you looking for his weaknesses? Have you? <laughs> yeah, of course. Satan's response is, you put a hedge around him, I can't touch him. And that's, that's the basis of the whole book. As they, is, is, is Job is a righteous man and Satan's looking to do evil. And God says, do your best on this man. He's a righteous man. He fears me. He hates evil. Do your best. And you see that in the beginning, he, he touches all of his material goods. He even steals the life of his children. And in the second chapter, he touches his body and brings illness to him. Skin for skin, all that a man has, he will give for his skin. If you allow me to touch him, he will curse you to your faith and the face. And then we see the, the, the way that that works out through the book of Job as we've been going through it chapter by chapter, looking at the arguments and looking at the insights that we can glean from such a wonderful book. But what were you doing? I have been going to and fro throughout the earth. I am looking for someone to devour. Have you seen Job? Now remember when the apostle Peter was speaking to the Lord Jesus Christ and, and they were having conversation at one time and, and Jesus had made the statement that, that, that the apostle was going to deny him and all of that, and, and that was something that was very difficult for the apostle to, to actually grasp hold of. I, I wouldn't deny you. I, 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 um, I would give up my life for you. And Jesus, how can you possibly believe something like that? How can you say something like that? Oh, Peter, Satan has desired to obtain you that he may sift you even as wheat is sifted. No, he has asked permission to and has gained permission to sift you, to take you, and to put you through a trial, but I've prayed for you. And after you've been converted, strengthen your brethren. No, Peter, you're about to go through something. Satan has looked at you and has asked for you. That's what he does. He has his minions. He has his, his military forces. They go off throughout the world. And they're, they're, we don't know the numbers but there's no doubt but that there are billions of them. And someone says, do I have my own personal demon? Why would you want one? Am I being watched? Well, it depends. Are you um, a follower of Jesus Christ? Yes. Okay. Then you have been, you're being watched. Oh, that sounds paranoid. Am I, are you saying I should be paranoid? No. You should be watchful and awake because the enemy is scrutinizing you. He's looking for your weaknesses. And, and by the way, he's been doing this since the very beginning, and he pretty much knows what you're going to fall for. He's already learned that. That's why Paul would speak and tell us that he is not ignorant of the devices of the devil, the stratagems of the enemy. Why? Because it's spiritual warfare that a lot of people don't even realize they're in. And the enemy has watched you, and he's assigned enemies, no doubt, who are undercover, if you will, to... Uh, secret agents for him and and they say well this one here has bad temper or this one here has a problem with sex or this one here likes their the alcoholic beverages this, and they see you they see your weaknesses and they report and then there 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 are the opportunities uh, that are given to you just to keep you in bondage and then you come to faith in christ and then when you come to jesus they still know that those were weaknesses and 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 you who haven't had a date in a long time and have a problem with women because you like to sleep with them and you're not married all of a sudden some girl calls you up after you get saved you went forward at an invitation. God just changed my life. And then all of a sudden, you know, here comes, you know, uh, some girl from your past who calls you up and says, hey, you know, you want a party? You want to come over? Whatever. And you go, oh, my God, I haven't heard from her in a long time. What am I supposed to do? As if you don't know what you're supposed to do. You know, <laughs> run away. She's a Jezebel. You know, <laughs> watch out. No, but that happens, doesn't it? That does. Some of you know what I'm saying. You know what happens. You got saved, and the first thing they, they, you, that happens a day later is you want to join? You want to drink? You want, the same life. They come back. Sometimes they knock on your door. They wake you up. Hey, man, come on. And she, I just I gave my heart to Christ just today. It happens all the time. Why? Because the enemy knows your weaknesses. He's been watching you. And he's observed you. He doesn't, I'm not important enough for him to watch me, but he's got a lieutenant or a sergeant or somebody that's assigned to me. And I know Rosales' weaknesses. And then, yes, they, they are presented. And yes, there are opportunities and all of that. But he's, he's going to be put away for a while. He's, he's not going to be able to do this anymore. He's not going to be able to be prowling for that thousand years. 
Now at this time, God has destroyed all human opposition. Many of the followers of Antichrist who survived, and they will, well, you know, they survived the tribulation. They'll die in Armageddon, and those who have survived and gone through uh, the judgment of the sheep and goats um, are going to still be alive. The Antichrist and false prophet have been cast into the lake of fire, and now the leader of all rebellion against God is dealt with. Satan is bound, and, and being bound will dramatically change the spiritual atmosphere of the world. He's going to be bound for a thousand years, then released. Up until this time, he has constantly fomented rebellion. He's inspired man to reject God. He's blinded minds. He's inspired evil. And he's trapped unbelievers. But now he's incarcerated. He's no longer going to and fro throughout the earth. He's not going to be loose in order to influence the evil, uh, evil in the world. And so as this is taking place, we pick up at verse 4 where it says, I saw thrones and they that sat on them and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image, had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. So you see in verse 4, these thrones, they symbolize, uh, they symbolize authority, uh, royal authority, as well as what is called judicial authority. And they are the glorified saints. In the Old Testament book of Daniel 7, verse 27, it says, The sovereignty, the dominion, and the greatness of all the kingdoms under the whole heaven will be given to the people of the saints of the highest one. His kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom, and all the dominions will serve and obey him. So these judges represent glorified saints. That includes the apostles. That includes New Testament believers. That includes the tribulation saints. In Matthew 19, 27 and 28, Jesus, uh, Peter was speaking to Jesus. He said, we've left everything to follow you. What then will there be for us? And Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, in the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Paul in 1 Corinthians 6 verse 2 said this, Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? Notice verse 4, judgment was committed to them. The judgments that occurs on those who survived everything. You see, unbelieving Gentiles are judged in what is called the judgment of the sheep and goats in Matthew 25. But Ezekiel speaks of unbelieving Israel being judged. Ezekiel 20, verses 35 through 38 says, I will bring you into the desert of the nations, and there, face to face, I will execute judgment upon you. As I judged your fathers in the desert of the land of Egypt, so I will judge you, declares the sovereign Lord. I will take note of you as you pass under my rod. I will bring you into the bond of the covenant. I will purge you of those who revolt and rebel against me. Although I will bring them out of the land where they are living, yet they will not enter the land of Israel, and then you will know that I am the Lord. Unbelieving Gentiles are judged, Matthew 25, unbelieving Israel, Ezekiel 20. Now notice in verse 4, I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the witness to Jesus. Tribulation saints. These are the ones who had been martyred. During the heat of tribulation, they were the ones who refused to take the mark, and they died. Included in their number are the two witnesses of chapter 11 and the martyrs of chapter 12. And then verse 4 says, They lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years, the millennial reign, a literal thousand-year reign on earth. You might want to note that the number 1,000 is used six times in seven verses. Let me talk to you about that for a minute. Here's a little more information. The millennial reign is a literal thousand-year reign. It fulfills Old Testament prophecy. In Psalm 2, verses 6 through 9, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will proclaim the decree of the Lord. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have become your father. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your inheritance, the ends of the earth your possession. 
You will rule them with an iron scepter. You will dash them to pieces like pottery. And so this is speaking of the rulership of Jesus Christ. But now it says they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. But now verse 5, the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such, the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. This is called the resurrection of the righteous in Luke 14, verse 14. This is what is called the first resurrection. Notice verse 6. The first resurrection. The first resurrection is not a single event. It's the order of resurrection of the righteous. It began with Jesus' resurrection in 1 Corinthians 15, 20. It says, Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. It includes those mentioned in Matthew 27, 52, and 53, where it says the tombs broke open and the bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs, and after Jesus' resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many people. It includes the raptured saints. In 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet call of God, the dead in Christ will rise first. It includes Old Testament believers. Daniel chapter 12, verse 2, multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will wake, some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. Finally, it includes the tribulation saints. Now, notice he says in verse 6, Blessed and holy is he who has part of the first resurrection. The blessing is that a child of God will not face God's judgment and eternal wrath. It speaks of those in verse 6 who are part of the first resurrection. They're priests of God, and they're going to reign. They reign during the millennium along with the saints who survived the tribulation. And once again, that'll be a time of peace, joy, and righteousness. The curse on earth is lifted, and there will be physical health. And then finally, verses 7 to 10. When the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, whose number is as the sand of the sea. They went up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints in the beloved city, which is Jerusalem. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Mm -hmm. During these years, Notice verse 7, when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released. During these years, only the redeemed have entered into the millennium. All believers, Jew and Gentile, enter the millennium in their normal physical bodies. Death will be possible. Long life will be the norm. Isaiah spoke of that in chapter 65, verses 19 and 20. I'll rejoice. I will rejoice over Jerusalem. Take delight in my people. The sound of weeping and of crying will be heard in it no more. Never again. Will there be an infant who lives but a few days or an old man who does not live out his years? He who dies at a hundred will be thought a mere youth. He who fails to reach a hundred will be considered accursed. Many who enter the millennium will still have physical bodies and sin natures. These are the ones who physically survive the tribulation. And because the parents still have sin natures, their children are born with sin natures. And as the years pass by, more and more children are born to the original parents. And each generation has sinners in need of salvation. Many will come to faith. But the tragic reality is not all will be saved in spite of Jesus reigning and bringing blessings. For a thousand years, Satan has been incarcerated. Earth has been under perfect conditions. But when Satan is released, he goes out to deceive the world once again. Now notice in verse 8, John says that he deceives the nations which are in the four corners of the earth. That's another way of speaking of the world, north, east, west, and south. He will find multitudes of people who are inclined to follow him. And that reveals to us that man's nature outside of regeneration is incurably evil. 
It reveals to us that even under perfect conditions, man will still sin. It reveals to us that Satan is beyond redemption. And third, it shows us that God's judgment is justified. When it speaks of Gog and Magog, that speaks of the leaders of the rebellion. Some would say that Gog is the human leader of Satan's forces and that Magog represents his people. And the number of rebels is enormous as they gather for their final war. But in verse 9, it tells us that they go out to start to fight. But fire came down from God and, and, and out of heaven and, and devoured them all. It's over. Boom. Done. That's what's going to happen. It's immediately over. And then the devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Let me close with some personal feeling about that. When I was a little boy, I was taken to what was called catechism classes. I learned some very basic things of Christian doctrine. And one of the things that I was taught at the age of about seven or eight was that Adam and Eve partook of a forbidden fruit and sin was passed on to all their children and that death and pain and suffering was part of what happens when in a fall. I was taught that at an early age and, and I was angry at Adam for a long time. I really was. I had a sincere anger at him. And I, would, I told my mama, how is it possible that under perfect conditions, and I was already wondering about these things as a little boy, how is it possible under perfect conditions that someone would be that stupid? Why? And look at our lives. Look what we're going through. You see, at the age of four, my mom had her first epileptic seizure when I was four years old. She was 24. So at the age of four, I, I witnessed my mom's first epileptic seizure. I was, I was in the front room playing, and my mom had closed the, 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 the door, and, uh, and I heard a sound of somebody, um, while well, the pocket door was vibrating, and it sounded, something was going on, so I remember sliding the pocket door open, and my mother's body falling at my feet, and I remember pressing my, my back against the wall with my mom's head right at my feet. And I was four years old. My brother was six. And my mom was having an epileptic seizure. I'd never seen anything like that. I, I didn't know what that was. How does a four-year-old know anything like that? My brother ran out of the house, house, crossed the busy street, went to a neighbor. Isabel brought her back. She brought some rubbing alcohol, put it in my mom, just sat with her until my mom came to. And that's the first time I ever saw someone have an epileptic seizure. But I started coming home very often uh, after that when I went to kindergarten to a mother who was sick on the floor or laying on a couch who was sick with, a, with epilepsy. And my mom had epileptic seizures all my young life, all my life. I saw my mom falling. I, many times I was the one who'd be in the home taking care of her at the age of six, seven, eight, nine, ten years old. My mom, when she was about about 28 years old, 29 years old, because of the medication that was prescribed, it had caused her gums to, to become diseased. And at the age of 28, my mother had to have every one of her teeth removed from her mouth. Every tooth in my mother's mouth at the age of 28 was removed, and she was wearing dentures from that time until she died. My mom didn't have a single cavity, perfect teeth, but they pulled every one of her teeth out. And I remember coming home, from school that day that they had done that. I must have been about nine or so. I remember coming home, and my mama was sitting on a couch weeping with a swollen, little swollen face. She said, they took all my teeth out. I saw my mom go through so much pain. A lifetime of it. So much pain. Till her later years, Mama got lupus. She had developed a condition in her bones so that her hands became like claws and her feet like claws. Mama would always have her hands hidden from people so they wouldn't see how gnarled, how deformed they became. 
Okay. I have a picture of her, the last Easter she ever watched me teach. She was living in New Mexico, and I have a picture of her watching me with a little hand raised like this, and you can see the gnarled hand. And my mama's last year, she fell down, broke her back, and spent the last year of her life in a bed with a broken back that never healed. I remember my father calling me, saying, son, can you pray for your mama? She's in so much pain. And I could hear my mom screaming in the back, Jesus, help me, Jesus, help me. All the pain, all the suffering, all the hurt, all the tears. But one day, he's going to be in that lake of fire and brimstone. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. And I am going to rejoice at the judgment that comes upon that evil one. Yes. Somebody says, do you really believe this? Come on, man. I mean, really, this is, this is, this is a story. No, it's real. It's a fact. This is pre-written history. This is what's going to take place. And one day, the Lord Jesus Christ is going to take him. Boom. You're going to be there forever. And you will no longer terrorize. You will no longer Cause people to live in fear of death. You will no longer encourage violence and the evil and the hatred. You will no longer be free to do that. You will be placed in this lake of fire and you will be held forever and ever and ever. And then we, we believers, we believers will have eternity to rejoice, to rejoice. And we will worship the Lord together. And we will sing songs of praise to him together. And we will be reunited with, with those who have gone before us. I'll have the opportunity of meeting a grandfather I never met. My grandfather died when my mom was about uh, 13 or 14 years old. Uh, and he was a believer. I'll, I have a chance to meet my grandmother, my mother's mother, who died when my mom was nine months old. Never met my grandmother. Never had a chance to see her, but she was a believer. I get to meet her. I get to be reunited with, with a baby that Marie and I lost and others that, that, that we, have, we have lost over the years. We have seen depart. I see my mom. I'll see my dad. My mom no longer will have crippled hands. And my dad and mom, I get to see them again. And you say, well, you know, I don't really believe that. I'm sorry that you don't. But I do, because it's the truth. And I will one day see Jesus Christ, who died on a cross for me, the one who wept at that, in, that, in that, that time of prayer in that garden, and I will get to see him, and I will say to him what I've re rehearsed now for many years, thank you, I love you. Those are the only things I can say for what you have done. You have blessed me with a wife. You have blessed me with my children. You have blessed me with my, my kids, my grandkids. You have blessed me with the church. You have blessed me with friends, and you have blessed me. I just want to say thank you, Lord, and I thank you for judging that enemy who, who tried to destroy, that enemy who did what he did, and he'll get what he deserves. And I look forward to that. God has blessed me. God has blessed you. These blessings that he gives to us are only just the beginning, because one day we shall see him face to face, and that enemy shall be placed in that that grave and it's uh, oh, that that lake of fire and it's interesting how Isaiah and I'll close with this scripture Isaiah in chapter 14 speaking of the enemy in verses 16 and 17 speaking to him says those who see you stare at you they ponder your fate is this the man who shook the earth and made kingdoms tremble the man who made the world a desert who overthrew its cities and would not let his captives go home look at you in the hand of god you are the nothing you are nothing and god is everything and i was afraid and worried about you when i had god on my side are you kidding god is on my side if if god be for me who can be against me god is the victorious one and for that we rejoice and Father, we do bless you for this. Lord, this is true. What you're doing and what we'll do is real. And Father, we would follow you with all of our heart. We will prepare our, ourselves to be with you in heaven. We will rejoice with you. And especially 
will rejoice over the judgment of that one who has caused so much pain. So, Lord, thank you. May we live as if we believed this, even as our eyes are closed and our heads are bowed for one last moment. If there's anybody here watching online in the overflow or in this room right now who needs to get right with God, Obviously, I can only see those who are in front of me. But if you need to get right with the Lord, even right now, if it's time, as before we close, as our eyes are closed and heads are bowed, if you need to get right with Him, would you raise your hand and let me pray for you right where you're at? Father, you see these hands that are going up throughout this place. And, and Lord, you see them throughout the world right now who are watching online. I ask in Jesus' name that everyone whose hand is being raised to you will at this time open themselves up and will say to you, yes, Lord, I will follow you. Forgive me of my sin. Cleanse me. And Lord, empower me so that I might live a life that is pleasing to you. Forgive me and fill me with your presence. And Lord, I will follow you. I'm not making a false promise to you. I will follow you. And with your help, I will be victorious. Lord, just fill me now with your presence and have your way. And be with me, Lord, as I, as I now go forth to serve you. Thank you, Jesus. I receive. You can put your hands down. And Jesus, I pray that you keep moving in every one of us, all of us, that we might live for you. In your name we pray. Amen.